course. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers. My name is Jay Chris Allen, as I said, and I'm a director here at the Canadian Club and your host today. Viewers, thank you for joining us. Our club is proud of a track record of bringing you decision makers and thought leaders to discuss the issues of today. Since the late 19th century, few institutions in this country or anywhere have enjoyed such staying power. We continue to attract great speakers and large audiences every season. We work hard to bring you not only a diversity of ideas, <clears throat> but of speakers as well, guests who reflect the rich diversity of our country, province, and city. And the digital, excuse me, the digital age hasn't slowed us down either. Instead of being afraid of what the fixation with social might mean for us, we use technology to encourage dialogue and engagement. You can learn more about us on our website, tweet or post on LinkedIn or Facebook, about our great events or order tickets online. I would like to add a special welcome to our youth and young leaders who joined us today from the University of Toronto's Political Science Department with Civic Action and Ryerson's Leadership Lab. We're glad you could join us. Welcome all and thank you for attending. Now let me introduce our speaker. Jennifer Kiesmat is a city builder and she wants us to be city builders too. The Toronto mayoral candidate has been campaigning hard since mid-August. Her goal, to bring her bold vision for Toronto to City Hall. Jennifer is already quite familiar with the city having served as Toronto's chief city planner for five years before stepping down last year. If things turn her way on October 22nd, she'll have moved to the mayoral chambers. The professional planner is a passionate and outspoken advocate of city building. Her platform includes four key priorities, community safety and well-being, road safety, transit, and housing affordability. These are areas she worked on in her role as Toronto's chief planner. And before she worked in municipal government, Jennifer held a number of roles in the private sector. She was a founding partner of Dialogue, an award-winning urban planning firm that operates across North America. She served as the CEO of Creative Housing Society, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the creation of affordable rental housing in Canada's major cities. Her contributions to the planning profession have been recognized by the Canadian Institute of Planners, the Ontario Professional Planners Institute, and the Design Exchange, to name a few. Jennifer has served as chair of the Urban Land Institute and has been a distinguished visitor in residence at the U University of Toronto. She's also got a great podcast called Invisible City that I listen to all the time. Jennifer, I'm pleased to pass the Canadian Club of Toronto podium over to you. Thank you so much, Jake. I love that shout out to the podcast. I was just talking about it. And we're going to be launching uh, next week an Invisible City podcast election edition. So you'll have to listen, you'll have to listen up for that. Hello everyone, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here at the Canadian Club. Uh, thank you for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to be on this stage, to be talking about ideas, to be talking about our city and our country and how we can transform our city and our country for good. Thank you all for coming today. So, Voters can be forgiven for having an awfully hard time over the past few weeks hearing about the municipal election. They can be forgiven. I mean, God, look at the fireworks and the stunning news that we see coming forward every day from so many sources. It really is an amazing time to be following politics in our world today. We're living in times when watching the news is almost a non-stop funhouse show and we've all got front row seats. But still, 
This campaign is finally underway. We have three debates this week, which is absolutely wonderful. And there are, will be more and more to come over the course of the upcoming weeks. And so it's time in this campaign, as it is in so many, for candidates to put forward their case, to spell out their case. And here is why I think that I should be hired for the job of mayor for the next four years here in the City of Toronto. First, with Doug Ford sitting as Premier of Ontario, we need a new and a strong leader at City Hall. This time, in this election with Doug Ford as Premier, the right man for the job for speaking up for Toronto just so happens to be a woman. And I'm up for that job. Second, we also know that our city is facing complex and growing problems on at least three fronts. And I'd like to talk to you about those three fronts today. And half measures, timid measures, aren't going to turn things around in our city. We need to act. And we need to act much more boldly to make sure that ordinary people can afford to live in this city. And we need to stop playing politics with our transit system. We need to get on with a real plan for delivering transit in this city. And we need to deal with community safety decisively. So let me talk a little bit more about why we need to be represented more strongly, which I really think is at the crux of this campaign. And then let's talk about how we can address these three challenges that I've just outlined, because we need to, we need to address them effectively, we need to address them boldly, and we can get real results in this city. We need to know that and we need to believe it. Let me begin with Mr. Ford. I fear that the events of the past few weeks are a clear sign of what is to come from Mr. Ford. I strongly oppose the Premier's interference in the Toronto election to settle old scores that he has from his time as a city councillor at City Hall. I was also extremely concerned with his proposal in the middle of an election and the proposed use of the notwithstanding clause to that end. And above all, I condemn the Premier's decision a few days ago to pose in a campaign photo with Faith Goldie, whose extreme and intolerant views have no place in our multicultural and diverse and tolerant city. It's completely unacceptable for the Premier of Ontario to have implicitly endorsed those views. John Tory said the following during the first debate, you should stand up for Toronto on the days when you actually have to. What does that even mean? I think he was trying to argue for his approach of making friends with Doug Ford. But I don't believe a soft approach to Doug Ford is going to serve Toronto. We need a mayor in the mayor's office who will stand up for this city every single day. That's what we need. A leader who will achieve fairness for our city from the provincial government by using the leverage that we have as a city and our central role in politics and economy of this province. I'll stand up to Doug Ford when he tries to bully us to settle old scores. I'll call him out when he endorses racists in the lunatic fringe of right-wing politics. And I'll stand up for Toronto. John Tory thinks we're dealing with a normal premier. My friends, we are not. So I think we need change in our approach to dealing with that premier. And if I'm elected mayor, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a different approach. Now, it's also time to change our approach to housing. We need to change our approach to transit. And we also need to change our approach to safety. So let me begin by talking a bit about housing, which is top of mind for all of us. 80% of the condos that have been built over the past four years were luxury condos in this city that most people cannot afford. Most people cannot afford the housing that we're building in this city. In the past four years, we did notch out one achievement on the housing file. We're now the most expensive city in Canada in which to rent. 
That's something we've achieved. It does not need to be this way. The cost of living is becoming increasingly unaffordable for the working class and for middle class families in this city. And the heart of that matter, the heart of affordability is really the cost of housing. It's a problem that we have both the resources and the tools to do something decisive about. This isn't a problem that's happening at us. This is something that with leadership, we can fix. Now, John Tory says that we shouldn't try to be too bold here, that a weak half measure on housing is really, it's the best that we can do. I simply don't agree. Managing housing is a core part of the City of Toronto's mandate, and I think we can do it well. I think we must do it well if our economy and if our city are going to continue to grow. Otherwise, our children, my children, and your children, they're not going to be able to live here. They're going to have to move out of the city. They're going to have to go somewhere else, whether they want to or not, because we've made the city too unaffordable. Our city owns an incredible amount of land. Much of it is in the form of low-density transit stations, surface parking lots, and other vastly underutilized spaces. The city has the power to set up the conditions on which these properties can be developed. And so we should do that. We should leverage our assets and our authority to change the housing market in this city. We can tilt it away from those luxury condo developments and we can tilt it towards the kind of housing that most people in this city can afford. My plan is that we do this at scale in order to get results that will actually have an impact on the housing market to the tune of 100,000 new high quality, purpose-built rental homes for middle-class families. We can do this. We can use the land we have as an asset to deliver housing that Torontonians can afford to live in. Saying that a half measure will just do, as Mr. Tory is saying, really means doing nothing. It's the status quo. Nothing will change. And housing in Toronto must change. We can't continue with the status quo. And so, if I'm elected mayor, I will change it. I will do that. Now, let's talk about transit. Four years ago, as chief planner, I was handed Mr. Tory's smart track plan and told to implement it. As the mayor knows full well, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because it wasn't a reasonable plan. It simply wasn't. Smart track was drawn on the back of a napkin by political strategists not by planning technicians, not by transportation experts, but by political strategists. It made no sense as anything but an election slogan, and almost none of it is happening. Smart Track promised 53 kilometers of track. None of that will ever be built. The 53 kilometers of new track is not happening. Smart Track promised fancy new London style commuter subway trains. None have been bought and none will ever be bought. It also promised 22 new stations, which would be developed at no cost to the City of Toronto, but instead through a special development levy on developers. Instead, we may add six new stations to the GO system. So these are GO tracks with GO trains as the GO system at a cost to taxpayers of $1.4 billion on a system that is otherwise fully paid for and operate, operated by the provincial government. That was John Tory's transit plan. And he is desperate. He is so very desperate not to talk about it in this election campaign. He's going to be an empty chair at tonight's transit debate because he doesn't want to be held accountable for what became of Smart Track. But the results are there for all of us to see. And I'm going to be holding him accountable over the course of this campaign in this election for those broken promises and the fact that our commute times and our congestion have just continued to get worse. Instead of political slogans concocted on the back of napkins, what we need 
is a real transit plan. And I've set one out. A network transit plan that builds subways, streetcars, LRTs and express buses where we really need them and gets them working together as a network to cut commute times in every single neighbourhood in this city. And integrated transit planning network is how Toronto used to build transit. We used to be a leader in this area. That's what we need to get back to. And if I'm elected mayor, that's exactly what we are going to do. Finally, there is the challenge of public safety. Too much of this city is unsafe by design today. There are too many accidents and tragedies at our intersections and in our schools and park zones and also on our residential streets. So that needs to change. Not with a photo op in front of a community safety sign, a road sign that's put up just before an election, but with serious and with real reform. A reform that re-engineers our intersections and our school zones in order to make them safe for both children and for senior citizens. And a reform that deals with speeding on residential streets where our children play by cutting the speed limit to 30 kilometers an hour. This is an international best practice. There is no reason why we shouldn't be doing this to keep our children and our seniors safe in this city. I believe our current mayor should be held accountable for the lack of action that we've seen on making our streets safe and the growing road safety crisis that we are experiencing in this city and that has grown over the past four years. I also think that he should be held accountable for saying in the last election that a handgun ban is an empty gesture. And now, a thousand shootings later in this city, over four years, a thousand shootings have made him change his mind once again. For many of us, hearing that boggles the mind. It's like we don't even recognize this city anymore. Nobody needs to own a handgun in Toronto. There's no reason to own a handgun in this city. We need to take a better and a new approach to safety. And if I'm elected mayor, that's exactly what we're going to do as a city. Let me conclude by saying that in offering you all of this, I'm offering a real vision. It's a vision of hope. It's a vision of optimism. It's a vision of belief that we can create real plans and that we can, working together, transform our city. We can do this. We can make our city better. This is an amazing city, and we shouldn't settle for half measures. We also don't need to put up with being bullied by a premier and abused by the unusual and not normal actions that he's taking vindictively against this city. We can stand up for Toronto, and don't let anyone tell you that we can't, that we don't have the power to do so. We absolutely do. That's what our city has always been. It's always been the voices and ideas and passion of the people who live here, standing up and building the city together. We aren't condemned to living in a city that the middle class can't afford to live in, a city where our children are forced to move away. Managing housing is at the heart of what the city does in its portfolio. And we do have the land and we do have the tools to make a real difference to the cost of living in this city. And transit doesn't have to be Toronto's version of the weather. This out of control mess that we talk about over the water cool and then the occasional tornado thrown into the mix. Transit doesn't need to be that. It wasn't like that in the past in this city. And it doesn't need to be that way in the future. We can stop playing politics with back of the napkin transit planning. And we can get back to data-driven, network-wide transit planning that will actually work, that will actually reduce congestion and will provide access to education and jobs across this entire city, not just in one part of it. And our streets can be safe. Our streets can be free from gun violence. By acting decisively on these issues and not dithering, not dithering any longer with half measures. I'm 
enormously excited about the potential of this city and the wonderful neighbourhoods and cultures and people and communities that make up every part of it. We can serve them better. And if I'm elected mayor, that's exactly what we're going to do. Thank you very much. Hello. All right. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, on behalf of the Canadian Club, I'd like to extend our thanks for bringing your passion and your bold vision for our city into our podium today. Um, so actually, before you go, I've got some questions for you, if you're open to it. <laughs> um, I figure if I could jump off the stage a couple times, you're, you're welcome to as well. Um, so uh, I thought to start uh, with uh, some questions from the audience and then maybe intersperse some of my own. Um, and the audience, as usual, came up with great questions. So uh, we'll start with the downtown relief line. Um, obviously a subject, sort of transit related close to your heart. Um, you said that you'd make it a priority. How can it actually be sped up? How do we actually get there? So the downtown relief line needs to be the number one transit priority in this city. And for a simple reason, it's 20 years too late. This is the reason why we have congestion on the Young Line. The Young Line is currently 120% at capacity, so over capacity by 20% during rush hour. And it creates a crunch point at inter Interchange Station at Bloor and Young. The relief line is about adding capacity and diverting that overflow, that congestion from Interchange Station. So this was one of the projects that I worked very hard on as a chief planner, uh, even though our resources kept getting pulled away and to put onto smart track, and that's precisely what's happened over the past year. Planning staff have been pulled off the relief line and they've been put on to those uh, six smart track stations. But the relief line is our number one priority. It is now 18 months behind schedule. We can deliver the relief line much earlier than is currently be being proposed. And the way that we can do it is by taking the tasks that have been laid out to happen one after another and folding them. And it's a simple project management approach, looking at the tasks that can be undertaken concurrently. So to give you a very specific example, uh, somewhere down the line, there is a task around purchasing the right of ways that are required for the tunneling. Well, we can begin doing that now. We know what the alignment is. We know what the station locations are. We can begin purchasing those right of ways now, and we can deliver the relief line three years earlier by making it a priority. All it takes is leadership. We don't have the leadership right now. It hasn't been the priority. That's why it's falling behind, and that's why we say so much congestion on our transit system today. Thank you. Um, a question about city powers in this time when they're very frequently been debated, being debated here, but also I think around the world. Uh, I personally think that cities are the future, and yet in our uh, country's legal system, that's not necessarily codified. Uh, how do we look to sort of the Vancouver Charter or other cities as models? Is there a way to move forward towards the devolution of power towards cities? Well, there's a tremendous amount that we can do right now that we're not doing as a city, so that's a starting point. Uh, it's a little bit rich to be asking for more powers when we're not using the powers that we already have as a city. And I would argue that has been a failure of leadership. Uh, it has been a failure of the current mayor to take the powers that exist in our City of Toronto Act, which is comparable to the charter that exists in Vancouver, uh, using that City of Toronto Act in order to deliver better city building. So as a very specific example, we have within that charter the authority to engage in participatory budgeting, to create stronger community councils. This would make council function much more effectively. So what's happening right now is all the decisions get rolled up to the city council meeting, and then we have these marathon three, four-day council meetings, and it's a big brouhaha and a big show. There's no reason why we can't better use those local community councils for decision making to deliver better local democracy and to create a more efficient decision making process in our city. We've got those powers, we should use them today. So a follow up on that, uh, somebody else asked, looking at London, looking at New York, 
how do you actually envision working with the community councils on a sort of day-to-day -day basis in a more constructive fashion? Well, one of the first things that is going to need to happen once this new council is put in place is going to be a whole exercise around creating a new municipal governance structure. And this is why leadership is going to be so critical. And we're going to need a leader who will act quickly and decisively. We can't take years to try and figure this out precisely because the entire community council structure is going to need to be changed. Uh, we're going to need strong leadership in working with communities, working with the new councillors in order to deliver that change. The risk, of course, is that we have a lot of dithering and delay and a lot of chaos. And you know what happens when we have that administrative chaos? We lose sight of the key priorities that we're already falling behind on. We need to be focusing on transit. We need to be focusing on housing and aff delivering affordable housing. We need to be focusing on public safety. And the risk, of course, is that we go through this big administrative exercise and we don't deliver on the key priorities that are essential to ensuring Toronto is going to be livable and a place where everyone can thrive. Good points. Um, on a lighter note, and uh, also sort of a pet peeve of mine, I'm lucky enough to see a new city, sometimes because I want to, sometimes because I'm forced to, almost every week. And consistently, I look back at ours, which I love so much, and I'm frustrated that the aesthetics, that the interestingness of some of our new developments in architecture can't compare to uh, similar cities in terms of their influence or economies around the world. And I'm curious, how do we incentivize developers, or perhaps force developers, to build uh, buildings that live up to the standards of Toronto? Well, this is a really great question. And in part, it's about design excellence, but it's also about making places for people, places where people will thrive. And one of the challenges that we face in this city is that we're growing very quickly, but we're not necessarily getting the kind of growth that is making a truly livable city. This, in some ways, goes back to the earlier question about community councils. The best developments in this city have a community-oriented process, and that community-oriented process delivers a better outcome. And I'll give you a specific example. When I was a chief planner, we advanced a significant project in this city, which was the Honest Ed's redevelopment at Bathurst and Bloor. And this is such an interesting project for a bunch of reasons. One is that it's over 900 units of rental. That project being rental, that came as a part of a community process. The community was very clear that they were willing to accept significant change in the neighborhood as long as it was helping solve a problem in the neighborhood. And that problem was the lack of access to rental housing. But working with the community, the developer did a whole series of other really interesting things. The Center for Social Innovation is directly next door, just, just uh, south of the site. And the leadership at the Center for Social Innovation, which is all about startups and entrepreneurs that are engaged in making the city a better place in some way, raised the issue of micro-retail. And one of the things you'll notice, Jake, in many of the interesting cities that you've been in in the world is that they have a lot of one-off retail. They have local entrepreneurs. They have local artists who have shops and galleries that you can visit in the fabric of the city. Well, the risk is that this all disappears in our city as we have large corporate entities that start taking over all of the retail space in the city. And I love Shoppers Drug Mart and I love banks, but we have to have more diversity in terms of the retail. And we want Main Street retail in our neighborhoods. So on that project, working with the community, and we created a whole process in the city planning department to ensure that we were linked into the neighborhood. One of the things that we were able to deliver is a whole micro retail strategy, in part because Bloor Street has lots of micro retail, and that site had been one big use for many years. And the plan was about reintegrating the site into the fabric of the neighborhood. And the best way to do that is through small scale retail. So there's a micro retail strategy. And how did that come about? That came about because of a process that was highly collaborative and that engaged the residents in the neighborhood with the city planning team and with the development. So I think the answer to your question is that we need to ensure that we don't break the link 
in this city, between the city and its citizens. And I would argue that's what Doug Ford is trying to do. He's trying to break that link. And we cannot allow that to happen. We have to strengthen the link between the city and its citizens. And we can do that through how we govern at City Hall. And that's the reason why we need a leadership, leadership that actually believes in this city and believes in the people of this city. And through strong leadership, we can continue to liver, deliver those kinds of excellent projects that are the kinds of places that you visit on your travels. Your weekly travels, it sounds like. Too much, too much, thank you. Um, a last question that I think comes back to some Canadian values that also might be being challenged across our country as we speak. Uh, and the question relates to the environmental impacts of development. Um, how do we, looking forward, build a city that takes into <coughs> consideration the environment first and foremost? Well, this is a critical issue because we experience global climate change, which sounds like a global problem, but we experience it in our neighborhoods. We experience it right where we live. And the challenge is we're going to continue to see more water in our city, and we need to plan for that water. Mr. Tory, approximately a year ago, kiboshed the plan, killed it, to address dealing with increasing flooding in our city in part because it's not a priority for him. We have an environmental plan at the city called Transform TO, an excellent environmental plan that was generated with a tremendous amount of community input, but it's unfunded because it's not a priority. Well, I can tell you when your basement floods, when your street floods, when we purchase new streetcars and they get completely flooded out and have to be taken off the streets, because we're not dealing with water in our city, that is an incredibly short-sighted approach to governance in this city. We need to be forward-thinking, and we're behind on this file. And it was very disappointing when Mr. Tory kiboshed those plans, when he killed those plans. We need leadership on this file. There's a whole variety of different ways that we can be creating green development in the city. I was very proud to implement the Toronto Green Roof Bylaw as the chief planner. We now have more, have more green roofs in this city than any other city in North America. And that was important work. That was about addressing water, greening our city, addressing the urban heat island effect, the fact that our city, cities are getting hot, hotter. But it's just the beginning with leadership that understands how significant a risk to our economy, our livelihood, and our quality of life that climate change is, we can embrace the work of C40 cities, where cities all over the world are putting environmental policies in place. We can embrace that, and we can do it in our city. And again, it comes back to leadership. It's not happening now because of leadership. It's not rocket science. We can do it. Thanks so much. All right, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so very much for joining us, Jennifer, on behalf of the Canadian Club again. So it's quite, uh, it's quite clear that uh, your love of our great city is, is in your bones, and uh, we all envision a city with thriving communities, safe communities, with residents that can affordably live in the accommodation of their choice as well. Um, we appreciated the way that you outlined your priorities for us, grounded in evidence, and your years of planning experience. All right. As our city continues to grow and develop, um, there is, as you pointed out, the need for strong infrastructure to deal with new and expanding neighborhoods. May the results of October 22nd bring you, Jennifer, your desired outcome. Thanks again for being with us today. So before we wrap up, um, a couple highlights of upcoming Canadian Club events. Wednesday, October 3rd, uh, please come and learn from the President and CEO of the YMCA of Ontario, Medhat Mahdi, uh, about the social challenges in our communities and how to confront them. On October 11th, welcome back the Right Honourable Stephen Harper as he launches his new book about leadership in this new era. Please plan to attend. And we'd also like to thank mediaevents.ca. Canada's online event space and VVC for live streaming today's event. Thank you all for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>